Listeners, readers, I'm so glad you've tuned in. Welcome to the Fox page where we dive deep into the very best literature. You'll come away with a richer understanding of the text at hand, all while learning to read everything a little better. Today, I am so excited. We are going to dive in to uh, one of our how to read segments. So today we're gonna tackle one of the most important facets of literature, which is simply narrative voice or narrative stance or perspective or point of view. This convention has lots and lots of different uh, names, different ways to think about it, and yet they all boil down to essentially who is telling the story and what voice is the reader hearing. So you can break this down essentially into sort of three categories. There is the first person, the second person, and the third person. So those of you who are not 53 and maybe didn't do a lot of diagramming sentences back in the day or aren't totally up to, uh, you know, up to snuff on your grammatical little schema, I will let you know that the first person is simply I, the first person singular, the first person plural is we. So if you were going to tell a story in the first person, you would say, I did this, I did that, or we did this, we did that. The second person is you. So the second person being either you, meaning one other person, or you as a group in English. Then the third person is he, she in the singular, or they in the plural. So what we have are these three different voices that you can use to tell a story. First person, I did this, I did that. Second person, you did this, you did that. Third person, he did this, she did that, that sort of thing. I mean, why so binary? But also that's kind of the way that the English uh, language is set up. So we're gonna dive in. I, I love these segments because we get to look at some of the very, very best literature, like really some of the most incredible uh, writing that the, the, the whole sort of um, you know body of English language has to present to us. We get to look quickly at these different things and, and sort of see the best that they have to offer before moving on to the next greatest thing. So today we're going to begin with the third person. The reason we're beginning with third and not first is that literary convention has it that the third person is the way that generally we tell stories, perhaps because we were always just gossiping. We were around that campfire as, as cavemen. I personally am actually a lot Neanderthal, so I would have been like a Neanderthal person back then. And I would have been telling a story likely about someone else, not necessarily about myself. He did this, she did that, they did this, they did that. So throughout the course of literary history, a lot of what was happening was reporting of what other people were doing, and that tended to be in the third person. So we're going to go way, way, way back. We're going to Japan, actually, on our first stop. We're going literally to the year 1010. I mean, this is like, it's the beginning of the 11th century. It was even hard for me to figure out, like, what year that would be, beginning of the 11th century. Turns out it's about the year 1010, at least as far as scholars can tell, when we have this amazing book called The Tale of Genji, which is, uh, many people think, the very first novel. Not only is The Tale of Genji the first novel, but it is uh, written by a woman. It's written by a woman, her name is Marasaki Ashkibu, and she, again, she was a woman of the Japanese court. So we're going to dive into this very, very, very old book uh, and see what the third person looked like in 1010. This is the first, uh, first line of this very, very long novel. Okay. In a certain reign, there was a lady, not of the first rank, whom the emperor loved more than any of the others. So if this sounds a little bit like a fairy tale to you, that is not a, a coincidence. This idea of, of telling a, um, a story from the third person, but also from, from a really, really sort of um, vast amount of time as if it had sort of always been the case. Um, you know, like this is where we get that sort of once upon a time convention. You have this sense of, of this omniscient narrator. So we're going to talk a bit about omniscience in just a moment. But here you have this omniscient narrator who is telling this story uh, as if it has sort of always been known and as if it is, is, is a truth. So you have this third person about the emperor and the lady 
Notably, the lady is not like of the finest ladies of the court. But you have these titles, you have it, um, it seems as if the narrator is, is telling the story from very, very far, far away. This is not an up close and personal view. We're talking about an emperor and a lady of the court. So it's as if the camera, if we're thinking in movie terms, it's as if the camera has pulled way, way back and is looking at these people as types who are in fact very far away. Okay, a quick note on omniscience. Omniscience simply knows, it simply means all knowing. So when you have what is called an omniscient narrator, which is actually, you know, through the sort of history of literature, that was often the standard, if not always the standard, uh, you had this omniscient narrator, meaning this third person narrator who was sort of godlike and who seemed to know everything that was going on and could give you all sorts of backstory, uh, in this case, about the emperor or about the lady. Uh, this, this kind of all-knowing, uh, omnipotent, invisible, godlike narrator would allow you to have all of the pieces of information you needed uh, about the woman's class, uh, about where she stands in the court, about the history of the emperor, presumably all of these intimate details because the tale of Genji is actually known as a pillow book. So it would have been um, a very intimate story on some level, and yet it would have been told by this omniscient narrator who knows all and who is able to go, um, you know, sort of not only into the background, but into the minds and the, uh, you know, sort of the, uh, the, the perceptions of all of the people in the book. So uh, I had a writing teacher once who said that you could only write in an omniscient voice. You could only write as an omniscient narrator if you truly believed in God, which I just don't really think is true. I really think one of the things that we should question, along with the idea that omniscient narrators are always telling a truth, is the idea that maybe you don't have to believe in capital G God in order to write in the omniscient perspective. But it is very handy. You can imagine all of the ways that it's very helpful to have an omniscient narrator because that narrator can fill in all of these gaps and all of these holes and backstories and it can tell us about motivation and it can um, answer all of our questions in this very handy, very authoritative, uh, sort of true speaking voice. So you can imagine there are also some problems with that because the history of literature is largely the history written by wealthy men. So you have a lot of, uh, you know, random people, well, sometimes very smart people, but you know, like really in the bigger scheme of things, kind of random people writing uh, at these sort of truths and writing big fat books that purport to, uh, you know, immerse you in a reality that is really just the creation of one person, usually a man, uh, who is claiming in fact to have this kind of God-like knowledge about a world that they are sharing with you. So just as soon as I have told you that the third person was largely the sort of standard for literature throughout history, I'm going to make an exception, which um, the next book that we're looking at quickly here, Don Quixote de la Mancha um, by Miguel de Cervantes, is uh, an exception. In fact, to so many of the rules uh, that, that were sort of standard, it was published in the beginning of the 17th century, so like 16, I'm gonna say 1603, right off the top of my head. Let me see how close I was. I'm back, 1605. I was off by two years, that's pretty good. Uh, so early 17th century, 1605, right around the time that Shakespeare is writing things like Hamlet and Macbeth, we have this Spanish writer who writes this insanely great novel, largely because it is breaking down all sorts of convention. In it, we have someone who is um, an unreliable narrator, who is really a man who lives in his dreams, hence the term quixotic. Uh, and, and, and we have this kind of flight of fancy in lots of ways that, that was just this unbelievably unconventional thing. Um, but it is very useful for our conversation today because it is uh, giving us a little bit of a shift from the third person in the tale of Genji to the first person here at the opening of Don Quixote de la Mancha. Okay. At a certain village in La Mancha, which I shall not name, there lived long ago one of those old-fashioned gentlemen who are never without a lance upon a rack, an old target, a lean horse, and a greyhound. Oh my gosh, you guys, we have got to do a, a lecture on this. We meaning I, because I'm just transported back to the Mancha here. Um, the, the Spanish Plains, that is. 
So what we have here is this really interesting kind of hybrid um, because we have this idea at a certain village in La Mancha, which I shall not name, you have that idea of kind of starting far away. We're starting with a geographical area in much the same way that with the tale of Genji, we have the idea of this emperor and this woman in the court. It, here we're starting with a, um, a much kind of lowlier situation, but we're talking about a village and, and it's it's named from far away. This is not, we're not sort of busting right into the middle of a conversation. We're not um, given someone's innermost feelings right away. We're, we're being situated sort of geographically and otherwise, um, but here we have this I, we have this first person narrator who it turns out is going to get up to some really interesting stuff in the course of the novel. But right in that very first line, because you have the distance of at a certain village in La Mancha, so you, you have this, um, you know, this sort of looking at it from very, very far away. And that, yet then we shift into this somewhat cagey narrator here who says, which I shall not name. So we have this very quick, um, you know, sort of mischievous narrator popping in and saying, I'm not going to give you all the information you want. But then he sort of, he, which is purposeful, um, then he, he brings the scope back out and describes this type who never is without a lance uh, and is never without their, their trusty steed and is never without all of the trappings of knighthood, which is exactly what this book is going to do. So you have this, this kind of hybrid in some ways where you have a, kind of an omniscient feel to the narrator, and yet the narrator is a person who is using the first person, I. Okay, so we began in 1010, we've jumped all the way to 1605, not 1603, and now we're going to jump ahead to 1813 to take another look at uh, uh, an example of the third person. Okay, do you know what was published in 1813 that we might be interested in? Ta-da! It is Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen. I'm very happy to include a woman here and a very capable and a very well-known and in fact still very popular today uh, writer named Jane Austen. And this is published in 1813. We're going to dive right in. And this is, again, this is, it's so fun for me to look at these first lines because um, they're honestly just so famous. I mean, at least for me, but I think that they will ring lots of bells for you as well. Here is the first line of Pride and Prejudice. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. So I love this for so many reasons. One of them is that we have our Jane here, um, our Jane Austen, really taking on this voice of authority. And not only is she taking on the voice of authority, but she is really just pumping up the jam on the idea of this, um, on the idea of the... Uh, uh, I just lost my train of thought, but it's coming back. Um, oh, on the idea of a truth. I mean, she's saying it literally right here. It is a truth universally acknowledged. True, Jane is a little tongue in cheek here. There's like a little bit of a tongue in cheek thing happening, but this is also just really her being uh, very, like she's gonna give us the truth of this situation and she's gonna, I mean, this is such a nimble and such an amazing omniscient narrator because there are so many people in these Jane Austen novels and so much is happening plot-wise that she really, uh, this is a, a narrator who really needs a lot of authority in order to be able to kind of spin out these yarns and to really have us care about the outcomes of all of these, uh, all of these women at the beginning of the 19th century. Okay, good. So that's another example of this kind of authoritative, omniscient third-person narrator. Okay, now we are going to jump ahead I'm going to read the, uh, the first line for you and you can maybe just uh, think about it. See if you can guess it yourself. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of us, no some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. Maybe you guessed it. 
Charles Dickens, Tale of Two Cities. So what's interesting here, again, is we have something a little bit like Cervantes, where we have this, um, we have a third person narration. I mean, and again, this is like a very Jane Austen kind of pronouncing the truth moment. Oh, by the way, we are in 1859, I believe. I'm checking my notes. I'm looking for my notes. 1859, boom, right here in my notes. Okay, so we have this omniscient narrator who is then pulling back to this we, which is of course the second person plural. But in this case, the we is, is kind of, it, it's just kind of like a, little, uh, like a little nuance that is added to this om omniscient and omnipotent narrator who is telling us this story. So, and the idea, I mean, this is a lot of very, very large truths that we are getting. And in a very declarative, very emphatic kind of language, uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. I mean, it's, it's really like about as generalizing and as kind of absolute as you can get. Of course, it's full of contradiction, which is the whole point of that opening, which is really actually very skillful and beautiful. Uh, but you do get a sense of kind of the, um, you know, this is sort of that really hardcore 19th century uh, omniscient narrator who really is sort of imbued with all kinds of authority. Okay, a quick look at Tolstoy, at Anna Karenina. Um, it's basically the same thing, but it's honestly so good that I wanted to just, you know, dip a toe. I think you'll recognize it. All happy families resemble one another. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So again, here you have this kind of, it's like a maxim. I mean, this has literally become one of these aphorisms that people kind of say. Um, and, and I think there is some truth, although are there any happy families? I don't really think so. So we've got Tolstoy this year is, um, I'm not gonna play the game this time, it's later. It's maybe 1870, oh, 1873. Okay, Anna Karenina, 1873, we're moving toward a big change that is coming at the beginning of the 20th century. Here we are at the beginning of the 20th century. We are going to look at James Joyce's Dubliners. So Dubliners was, uh, he wrote most of it, James Joyce did in, um, it was finished by 1904. It took him 10 years to publish it because he was really a stickler about not um, making any changes for publishers, which I mean, if you're James Joyce, you really gotta stick by your, uh, your convictions, but what we have here is modernism. You're going to have to listen to another how to read section of the Fox page to learn all about the, uh, you know, the various sort of um, literary epochs, eras, um, classes, genres. Today, my brain is not coming up with, with a concise way to talk about that. But things like romanticism, realism, naturalism, modernism. So modernism is what was ushered in essentially, well, largely with the Industrial Revolution and, and with the way that poverty um, and, and social movements really became important around that the turn of that century. And then especially with the First and Second World Wars. So what essentially happened is that this idea of this omnipotent, omniscient, all-knowing, you know, truth deeming narrator really started to break down for people. There was sort of this, I mean, it's right around the same time of like, you know, the big newspaper headline that's like, God is dead. Right around the same time, you know, the, the, the sort of the narrator, that omnipotent, om omniscient narrator also kind of dead in the sense that people weren't as willing to just sort of believe things like, it is a truth universally acknowledged, blah, blah, blah. It was sort of like no truths should be universally acknowledged anymore because so much was going wrong in society and sort of this on this worldwide, um, you know, turmoil with the first and second world wars. Of course, this is everything I have said today is a highly Western kind of Euro American centric. So far, it's been totally Euro centric plus Japan. Um, this is, you know, I, I have my knowledge, my body of knowledge, and it is not uh, global, not as global as I would like. So take that with a grain of salt. But so uh, this book was, he was writing it, he was done with it in 1904, which is obviously before the, uh, the First World War. So, but you already have, it's kind of, and this is a more realist novel than the later modernist works like Ulysses that he will go on to write. 
the other big modernist readers are, I mean, writers are Virginia Woolf, uh, William Faulkner. So, you know, that kind of slightly more experimental and, and just sort of um, really uh, like um, kind of asking questions about the narrative stance and, and the form of the novel and deciding that it doesn't really work anymore to have these kind of decrees about truth and these long tomes that that were purporting to, to you know, give you the whole world like a Madame Bovary sort of a moment. This is much more like we don't have the arrogance to be doing that. And in fact, we need to really uh, interrogate the ways that we are receiving truths. So, but Dubliners is a little bit more traditional, but what we have here is the first really sustained, I mean, the first one we're looking at today. It's not the first sustained first person of all time. And then with the advent of modernism and this idea of, of a narrator as being someone who is more identifiable and maybe not so omniscient, you have more first person narrators kind of cropping up. So Dubliners is a very good example. We're gonna take a look at the very first line of the very first story. There was no hope for him this time. It was the third stroke. Night after night, I had passed the house. It was vacation time and studied the lighted square of window. So this is a young boy who's narrating, which is important. Um, Dubliners sort of uh, spans uh, the lifetime of this young person and is a real portrait, in fact, of an entire community, Dubliners, as the name suggests, which is interesting because I would argue, and Joyce certainly was arguing this, that the best way to uh, to give a sort of a more general picture is to become a little more granular. It's to become a little more, you know, to have a certain perspective, which in this case is this young boy, very autobiographical in most ways, um, and, and look at his personal experience with personal details and, you know, as a way to explore the larger community. Okay. So that is Dubliners. Now we are going to move on to 1925. So in 1925, we have the publication of The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. And this is, um, in some ways, it's a continuation of the idea of uh, Joyce's first person narrator in Dubliners. It is sort of an extension of this concept, a very zeitgeisty thing at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, uh, I'm not sure, we don't want to classify Fitzgerald as a full modernist, but he definitely has modernist elements and was definitely part of that whole era, simply in, in, in part because of uh, the timing. So it was 1925, Mrs. Dalloway is also 1925, to the Lighthouse is 1927. But we have this first line of, uh, of The Great Gatsby. In my younger and more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my mind ever since. Which is a great, uh, I mean, it's such a great line. And in fact, the narration in The Great Gatsby is, I mean, I could talk for days and days about the, the Nick Carraway. So this is this kind of, um, he, sometimes it's called a, uh, a peripheral narrator or a peripheral first person narrator. It's simply someone who's telling the story with a bit of remove. Uh, they're, they're part of the world of the story, but they're not totally involved in it. And it's a really good convention because it allows us to, uh, like the, the narrator is close enough to have a good understanding of what is happening, but the narrator is also far enough to have a little bit of objectivity and, and to sort of ask questions and to be curious about what's happening. They're not a fish in water. They're not someone who is so uh, mired in, in the story that they can't see it. In fact, they're someone who is bringing a very inquisitive and, and, and uh, you know, very sort of objective, sort of objective perspective onto the whole thing. So this does get us to one of the limitations of the first person, which I'm always really interested in. And it is the following. And sometimes Fitzgerald uh, gets a little bit out of his grasp. So in that story, you have Nick Carraway, who moves into the small little cottage, cottage next door to Gatsby's huge, big, elegant home. And uh, the story is very much Nick Carraway's. He is telling it from an institution where he is residing at the very end of the novel. Um, so he's a very important person and yet he is only one person. So the limitation of the first person is that sometimes in Gatsby, you know, it's not 
it's not ever like really clumsy where you're like, there's no way this is happening. But a lot of what is happening, um, it, it's a little bit of a stretch of the imagination and of credulity to believe that Nick Carraway would know all of this stuff. So, I mean, you can think about it. The, the first person is, is a little limiting. It's a limiting kind of a narration because one person can only know so much. They can only have, you know, one certain objective uh, perspective and they can only ask so many questions and it's only plausible for them to have certain interests and certain, you know, uh, like certain experience of their own that they're bringing to the story. So, and also just kind of logically speaking, they're just simply not present for everything that is happening in the story. Oftentimes, this is actually very well used because an author will be able to, you know, because this first person narrator is not uh, like really part of the whole thing, some of the information can be withheld. So there's some very cool things that can happen um, in terms of how information is given to this narrator that can really add suspense. So the limitations of the first person narrator can also be turned into some real strengths, uh, but there are some real limitations if you are trying to tell someone else's big story. Obviously, if it's a first person narration and they're telling their own story, it's not quite as limiting, although you then have other limitations, which we um, will get to. I'll look at one more first person narration. So this is um, Brad's Head Revisited by uh, Evelyn Waugh. And I just, I really enjoyed this book. It's, it's kind of a trifle, kind of light. He was one of those um, brilliant young things, bright young things um, in the 20s. And I, I did, he was kind of hanging out with all the Mitford sisters. He's very like, he's in sort of in Pursuit of Love by Nancy Mitford, which is amazing. If you haven't read it, you should and listen to the, uh, to the lecture on the Fox page. But here we have at the beginning of Brides Had Revisited, our narrator. When I reached C Company lines, which were at the top of the hill, I paused and looked back at the camp, just coming into full view below me through the gray mist of early morning. So this is so interesting because you're getting a little, um, you, it's a little more sophisticated first person narrator in the sense that it is asking the reader to know more. We're not starting with this very, very full, you know, pulled back camera that's saying, basically like once upon a time there was a Japanese court and there was an emperor and there was a woman. So it's not, it's not pulling that far back and telling the story with, with that much um, scaffolding. It's more, it's trusting that we readers will be able to understand when he says, when I reached C company lines, that we understand that this is a soldier, we understand that there's a war going on, um, we understand that we are going to be given a lot more information about this person, but we're definitely kind of dropped into the middle of a story, which is a beautiful way, um, I think, of, of really grabbing the attention of the reader, and it's something that the first person narration is very good at. You can also, of course, drop into the middle of this situation with a third person narrator, absolutely, but, but I think uh, this is a good example of, of the way that after modernism, so this book is 1945. Let me check the notes. Uh, 1945, boom. So Brides Had Revisited is 1945. So you're having, it's immediately following the, the Second World War. And, and you have, I think, for my money, a much more interesting uh, narrative style because you do have more stories that are beginning sort of in media rest, you know, beginning in the middle even of a sentence or a thought that sort of just plunk you down in the middle of the action instead of like a very John Steinbeck or Mark Twain thing where you're really far back and then you're, you know, moving in and you're learning about the geography and then you learn a little about the people and then you learn a little about the seasons. I mean, I'm making that sound awful and all of that is good too, but I really do uh, enjoy this idea of instead of a big pronouncement, like we saw in lots of those omniscient narrators from the 19th century novel, in the 20th century, we're getting into narrators that are a little more, um, they're taxing the reader in a way that I think is very interesting and healthy. Okay, so I wanna look at a very important uh, aspect of the third person narration that it was something, um, it was really kind of the lifeblood in some ways of the modernist movement, it, although it began, you know, arguably with Flaubert. It began in 1957. Wow, people, sorry, 1857 when he published Madame Bovary. 
So he was very famous for something called free indirect discourse. So that is simply the following. You have that same uh, omniscient narrator, a narrator who knows everything that's going on and, and sort of purports to, to paint this very detailed and, and very um, full image of an entire world. And you're expected to believe that all of those things are true. And you're supposed to just kind of like, you know, revel in all of the, the, the sense of being present in this world. But the free indirect part means that the free part is because this narrator is able to move into the consciousnesses of all of the different characters. So not only do you have this this narrator who can tell you all the kind of truths about a world that is being created by the author but in this case the narrator can move into the it's like a body snatchers thing he can move i never saw that movie i don't even know what a body snatcher is but you know um you he he can move into a, a character and tell you um, essentially what that person is thinking. And also one of my favorite things is it, the, the narrator should, if they're worth their salt, be using the language of that person. So one of the things that this does is it's very sort of democratizing because we begin to hear the voices, not just of this omniscient, typically male authoritative figure, but we're having the language of, you know, young women who are like the scullery maids, whatever that is, or, um, you know, you have a, a, a boy who is a, a peasant or a serf. Um, or, you know, in Madame Bovary, we have the, the, the young helper of the doctor. So we have this a much broader uh, vision of the language of society and society itself. So we're going to take a look at, oh my gosh, it's just, it's one of my favorite novels. It is my favorite writer, Virginia Woolf. Uh, and we're going to dive in very briefly to a scene that's relatively late in Mrs. Dalloway that is an excellent example of this free indirect discourse. So this is a scene um, from Mrs. Dalloway. In this version of Mrs. Dalloway, it is on page 150 and 151. So this is after uh, Lucrezia has learned that Septimus has died and Mrs. Filmer and a doctor are both attending to her, uh, but she does not know yet that Septimus has died and Mrs. Filmer is concerned about, uh, about her knowing. But Mrs. Filmer poo-pooed, oh no, oh no, they were carrying him away now, ought she not be told? Married people ought to be together, Mrs. Filmer thought, but they must do as the doctor said. Let her sleep, said Dr. Holmes, feeling her pulse. She saw the large outline of his body standing dark against the window. So that was Dr. Holmes. One of the triumphs of civilization, Peter Walsh thought. It is one of the triumphs of civilization as the light high bell of the ambulance sounded. So it's a little choppy reading this and I, I hope you're not too discombobulated. Although in part, Wolf is wanting the reader to feel a little bit unmoored and a little unsettled here at what is sort of the, the well, it's not exactly the climax of the novel, but it is a denouement. Um, it's sort of the falling action of the novel that is very intense and very difficult for everyone. Everyone's under a lot of stress. But what we wanna look at here is this narrator who is no longer um, this kind of all-knowing, you know, authoritative, like telling us a pronouncement, you know, all happy families are the same. It's, it's not anyone making a pronouncement. It's someone who is a very closely identified with the characters in the story. This Mrs. Filmer person um, is a very minor character and is someone, you know, of, a, of sort of a working class. And, um, when she's concerned, you know, they were carrying him away now. So she's she's reporting what is happening in the story. Septimus is being carried away. And then she has this, um, this thought. Married people ought to be together, Mrs. Filmer thought. So you have, and it's not, there are no quotation marks or anything. This is Wolf. This is this stream of consciousness thing um, that she's so famous for. So, but you have this signpost here that we are still in Mrs. Filmer's mind. This is what Mrs. Filmer is thinking. And then it's so masterful and so deft. Then we move on to this next part, but they must do as the doctor said. So you have this, this, she's sort of having her own thoughts and then her respect for authority kind of hijacks those thoughts. And she's like, oof, but we have to do what the doctor says. And then it's so amazing. You have um, the next paragraph begins and the doctor is saying, 
this following thing. So it's this, this kind of bowing to authority and then authority fills that vacuum right away with, let her sleep, said Dr. Holmes, feeling her pulse. So I think that you can, this is so incredible to me. So when you have let her sleep, said Dr. Holmes, feeling her pulse, you can see that as Dr. Holmes feeling her pulse, meaning that because of the way that we read quotation marks uh, and it's quotation, let her sleep, end quote, said Dr. Holmes, comma, feeling her pulse. So you, you're really very much with Dr. Holmes and you can sort of have a sense of him feeling Lucrecia's pulse, but it also needs to be read as feeling her pulse and it's as if also we are Lucrecia feeling the doctor because it says, uh, said Dr. Holmes feeling her pulse. She saw the large outline of his body standing dark against the window. So that was Dr. Holmes. So when we have the quotation of him, we're sort of firmly with him, but then very quickly and very deftly, we move into Lucrecia who is lying there. So you guys, literally this is like five sentences and we have been in Mrs. Filmer's head, then we've been in Mr. Uh, Dr. Holmes's body and we've felt her pulse. You know, you can almost, you can just feel it. You know, you know exactly what that feels like. And then we are with Lucrecia who is lying down and seeing the bulk of him against the window. Then we have a little space break and we are moving into the mind of Peter Walsh, one of the triumphs of civilization, Peter Walsh thought. It's so good. It's jarring and it's different, but she's also beautifully tying this together because of course this triumph of civilization that Peter Walsh is talking about is the ambulance which is bringing Septimus and Septimus just left at the top of the page. It's like a miracle. Reading is a miracle. This is, it's, it's just unbelievably well done. So, I mean, nobody does the indirect, the free indirect discourse quite like Wolf Flaubert, also really good at it. Lots of people are really good at it. Faulkner's great at it. James Joyce is great at it. But I just, you know, for my money, it is one of the things that truly makes Virginia Woolf exceptional. So I think we had a good little example of how that works, of that, that idea of being able to enter into the minds and the thoughts and the words and the language of all of these different, uh, all of these different people. It's a miracle in only like seven sentences. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna look at before we finish today, um, you might be wondering why we jumped straight from first to third. We went from, er, from third to first. So third person, you know, that, that omniscient uh, narrator, that he, she, they, you know, pronouncing kind of authoritative voice gave way, um, you know, first with Cervantes and then later with other people and certainly a lot in the 20th century to the first person narration. Um, I love both. I think you can do a huge amount with both. The second, I mean, the first person can be a little bit more limited. I did have a writing teacher at Bennington who was, it was so smart. He said, if you're going to write in the first person, you need to, you, I mean, it sounds so basic when I'm saying it, but for all you writers out there, um, you have to say why this person and why now. And the why this person to me tends to be like fairly obvious, but the why now is a very good question to ask yourself if you're writing a novel. Why, why at this moment is it important? Why is Nick Carraway writing this story about Gatsby? Well, it's because he's been hospitalized and he is having to reflect on the ways in which his life deteriorated. So you have, you have this, um, these good questions about the limitations and the possibility of first person. Third to first, we did skip over second person and here's why. Second person is you, either you singular, mostly you singular, but it can be also in English, you as the plural. Um, it, it can be that group of people also. Uh, but you can imagine that the you, the second person is a very difficult uh, perspective to write in. It's really hard to sustain over a long novel without becoming really kind of cumbersome and heavy handed. I have not really ever read a book that I have loved in the second person. I'm going to give you two examples of important ones. One is from 1979. I don't even have these books anymore. Um, I did have both of them at one point. I don't have them anymore. So I had to, um, I had to make a photocopy here. The first is, um, the first is from 1979 back when I was 10 years old, uh, by Italo Calvino. So he was a writer who, uh, you know, sort of that postmodern thing where he got really um, 
all these various sort of hyper intellectual men got really into like playing with literature. And this is a very good example, like playing with the conventions of the novel. So this is, I love the title of this book. Um, it's called If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. I, it's like the most compelling uh, title. Unfortunately, the book itself did not quite live up in my mind to the title. This is the very first line of it, and it is the second person, and I think you'll immediately see why the second person is perhaps a little trickier than first or third. You are about to begin reading Italo Calvino's new novel, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. Relax, concentrate, dispel every other thought, let the world around you fade. Best to close the door, the TV is always on in the next room. Tell the others right away, no, I don't want you to watch TV. Raise your voice. They won't hear you otherwise. I'm reading. I don't want to be disturbed. Okay, I'm actually loving the beginning of this right now because that's literally me. Although you guys know how much I love television. I mean, in the evening, I am always watching TV, never reading. But I totally get this um, idea of like, no, quiet. I'm in here reading. Don't disturb me. But you can see slight digression. You can see here where this, you did this and you did this, relax. I mean, then he goes on and tells you first take off your shoes, do this, do that, do the other thing. It's called the imperative tone. It's not, it's not great in my opinion. It's, it's, it's a little tricky because in this case, he's also directly talking. It's the author and this authorial voice, this narrative voice is talking directly to a reader, which is always the case. But in this case, it's kind of hyper, uh, it's like, a hyper case of that because we are it's very much about the experience of reading this novel in comparison with another book that I actually really did like when it came out in 1984 uh, which is Bright Lights Big City by James McInerney I mean Jay Jay McInerney um, so the first the first couple of lines of Bright Lights Big City are and this came out in 1984 you are not the kind of guy who would be at a place like this at this time of the morning. But here you are, and you cannot say that the terrain is entirely unfamiliar, although the details are fuzzy. So I like this better. I like this better in part because we know as a reader, again, readers have gotten pretty savvy about different narrative uh, stances, different perspectives. We know here that when he's saying you are not the kind of guy who usually finds himself in a nightclub at this hour of the morning, uh, we know that we aren't actually that guy. I mean, readers can make that kind of a leap. But you know that you're meant to feel like that guy and you're meant to suspend your disbelief and to sort of go with this idea that you are going to inhabit the, the sort of mind space of this guy and you're going to like it. Just kidding. But I mean, kind of. Like the idea is that he's going to really sink you into the life of this guy, which is going to be painful in most ways. And you are going to um, really like really be so in it that it's like as if you were the character. So you can see that in some ways it's a very strong thing. It's a very bold take, certainly, because he is placing you in this case in the, the life that honestly very, very few people, I mean, no one's ever lived this actual exact life at this exact time in this exact space, but he is having you, um, I mean, for 99% of the people who read this novel, maybe not quite that much, um, it, it is a real departure from their regular lives. They are not prostituting themselves for cocaine. You know, um, it's, it's, it's kind of a gnarly book, as I recall. Whew. But it was, it's a very strong and I think a very good example of how the second person can be used well. But it's also, um, you know, considering that it was very, it was tricky to come up with some examples of the second person, largely because, again, it is a very difficult, uh, it takes a lot more skill, I think, and um, to wield this second person narrator. And, um, you know, those books are not huge classics. I mean, Italo Calvino is kind of a little bit, but like, I mean, is it really? Uh, okay, I am going to leave it there. I hope that you have gotten lots out of the discussion today of narrative stance, and I hope that you've enjoyed all of those first lines. It's so fun for me to pull these how to read lectures together just because it's such a delight to just uh, dip a toe into all of these amazing pieces of literature. So next time you open a novel, 
take a quick second to uh, get a sense of what kind of a what kind of a narrator you've got. And if you've got a really great one, pay attention, you know, t throughout the novel, not just in the beginning, to why um, that certain narrative stance is being used and what you as the reader are getting out of it. So thank you for joining me and uh, happy reading. Get back to the Fox page soon and find something else to listen to. Okay, bye.